I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 92 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 092. Well, we're going to bring back the gun of the show for this episode, and the gun of the show for this episode will be the Colt Delta Elite. It's going to tie into the main topic, so why not? You know, I've always wanted a 1911 pattern firearm and chambered in 10 millimeter. And some people may say, well, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of like a uh, blooding for punishment. You know, the Glock's a better performing 10 millimeter for the money. And I won't deny that the Glock's a good gun for the money on the 10 millimeter. In fact, for the money, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better 10 millimeter. But for me, the better gun or the better flat forms, the 1911, I shoot it better. I carry it better, and I don't want to change platforms every time I go hunting. So, I got a 10 millimeter in the form of a Colt Delta Elite. And I could have picked up a Sig P220. There, I found one of them. I could have picked up a, I forget what model, but it, I want to say it's a Kim. It was a Kimber, and I want to say it's an Aggies, but I'm not sure. I found it on the phone, and then just on a hunch, I called another location and they told me they had a delta elite i i restrained myself i drove the speed limit i thought oh this is an old production gun turns out colt had started producing them again this was a brand new gun which was even better however i got there paid for it filled out the 4473 presented my chl and my driver's license everybody tells me this store runs a chl through nicks but they didn't i then took my uh, money, paid them, got my gun, and left. The funny thing was, I was open carrying, and this was from a big box store. I was open carrying a 1911 on my hip, and they're walking me out of the store before they hand me the gun that I bought, even though I have another gun on my hip. Hmm, makes no sense. But they did not run me through Nick's. The transaction was painless, and then I went to a range, shot it, and bought another gun. However, some people might say, well, why a 10 millimeter? Why not carry one of your 44 mags? Like I said, I don't want to change platforms when I go hunting. I don't carry the 10 millimeter as a daily carry. In fact, when I go hunting until I'm ready to, and actually until I get to the location where, where we're hunting or we're checking the cameras or something like that, I don't even carry that one. I carry my regular 45. We get there, I change guns, and then we do our thing. Either we hunt or we check the cameras because where I'm hunting, it's hog infested. In fact, that's what we are hunting there. Anyhow, let me run down on my information sheet I've got on it and then we'll get the audio clip that tells you how to get the show and we'll come back to some listener feedback. The model on this one is model number 02020 or for those of you who prefer one or two digits, 02020. Now it's chambered in the 10 millimeter, has an 8 plus 1 capacity, like all 1911 pattern firearms that are true to the pattern. It is a single action. The sights are GI style with three dots on them, so they're not GI style sights per se, but I like it. It's a nice throwback. This particular gun, stainless steel, although you can find the blued versions, it weighs in at a hefty 2 pounds and 7 ounces. And it has an MSRP of $1,099. Call it $1,100. Overall, I'm very pleased with the gun. I haven't found any ammunition it doesn't like. It runs well. It does the job. And what can I say? It's accurate. I mean, it's not as accurate as my TLE2 or my STI, but it's pretty close. In order to tell the difference, I'd have to shoot them from a rest and take my time. And in a handgun, it's that level of accuracy really doesn't matter because you're not out there at ranges where it's going to matter. But hey, I'm rambling, so let's hit the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. Then we're going to come back and hit some listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. 
Okay, we're coming back to some listener feedback, and I'm going to narrow it down to the only two that I haven't emailed people back on. And the reason I haven't emailed these people back is because I haven't had time. And these are both older emails. Now, the first one, we got a listener that's writing, asking for my opinion on backup guns. And I want to read you a quote from the email. I am interested in a backup gun because I recently took a class that showed me why a backup gun is so necessary. Oh, man, I'm going to mispronounce it, but or I almost mispronounced it. Why a backup gun is so necessary. Now, in the class, they did not teach us anything about choosing a backup gun because they obviously left it open as a subject to be covered in their backup gun class that they offered the following weekend. Unfortunately for me, work prevented me from taking the backup gun class. I fully intend to, however, until then, I would like to get a good quality backup gun. I am leaning towards a revolver because I can carry a revolver in a full power cartridge and not have to worry about reliability. Alternatively, I am considering the purchase of a semi-auto just because of the thin profile and the easy concealability. Do you mind telling me what you think and why? Okay. <clears throat> in the email he mentions, and I am not a big fan of this concept, he mentions revolvers don't fail or well in one part of the email he says revolvers don't fail in the other he says uh they're super reliable the thing is they're machines and machines do fail in fact revolvers fail often enough that they have failure drills for them and he mentions the profile of the semi-auto being a key can a key selling point for him and a revolver isn't exactly a uh thin profile firearm Capacity is an issue with a revolver. With that said, I have been known to open, or not to open, but I have open carried a revolver, but I have been known to conceal carry a revolver as a backup gun. Now let's bust some myths about the semi-auto that he included in his email. He indicates you cannot get a semi-auto in a full power cartridge. That's wrong. I carry a backup gun chambered in 9mm. It's a semi-auto and it fits in my pocket. You can find them made by just about everybody. I know Sig makes them, Ruger makes them, Glock makes them. Um, I think it's the Glock 43. Might be the 42. I think the 42 is the 380, and the 43 is the 9 millimeter. Uh, I think Smith and Wesson does. I forget who it is, but I was in Lubbock at uh, what was the name of that? Oh, it's a Cabela's Outpost. I was in Lubbock at the Cabela's Outpost, and I saw a 40 caliber pocket gun. That's not something I would like to shoot. No, not at all. Hmm. As far as a revolver, yes, you can carry them in a uh, full power cartridge, but typically they're very recoil prone because of the high center, the high center of the bore. If it were me, I would probably just choose a good, reliable semi-auto. Now, where you carry the gun and how you intend to carry it is important too. If you're going to carry it in a jacket pocket and plan to be able to shoot a attacker from inside that pocket which is very difficult and i recommend you get training before you try it then definitely carry the revolver because the semi-auto will most likely get hung up on the cloth inside the jacket and fail to cycle and then it turns your jacket into a into a type of club i forget the technical term for it i'm half asleep it's been a long day and i didn't get much sleep last night overall in my opinion the semi-auto is a better choice in the modern environment you can carry a reload for the semi-auto, and it won't be very much more bulk than carrying the backup gun itself. You can carry, let me think here, I'm trying to remember, what uh, what's it called? Speed loader. You can carry a speed loader for a revolver, but then like the revolver, it's got the bulk because it's got to be almost the same exact size as the cylinder in order for you to be able to load the gun. In reality, there's not that much difference in weight between the two platforms. Each has strengths in certain areas. Each has weaknesses in certain areas. I would recommend taking the taking the backup gun class and seeing what they recommend. And maybe they'll have a number of different options to try at the class where you can actually try your hand on them before you make a decision. Additionally, you might see if any of your local shooting clubs have a backup gun match. And go watch it. See who's shooting what. Find out why. That might influence your decision too. If a revolver is really going to be that much more reliable and better, then I have a sneaking suspicion that revolvers will dominate the backup gun class. 
or the backup gun match. I'll tell you right now, I don't think they will. I think you'll see a split between revolvers and semi-autos. It may be as close as 60% semis and 40% revolvers, although I'm going to say it's probably probably going to be closer to 80% semis and 20% revolvers at most. Okay, that's enough of that email because I have taken way too much time on it. We have another email, and I want to read one line from it, and then I'll address it. Love your podcast, but I think it most likely is another individual named Micah Johnson. It's a common name, and this is in reference to the high-capacity episode number two. Excuse me. Okay, that's the only line in the email that really addresses anything that needs to be covered on the in the response section let's talk about the background here because people may be a little confused waller county who sued terry holcomb of texas Kerry, reported that they were receiving death threats now on the waller county news.blogspot.com blog there is a post where micah johnson is mentioned as having made death threats against the waller county district attorney that filed the lawsuit Now, those of you who don't know who Micah Johnson is, that's the name of the individual who shot and killed five Dallas PD police officers and wounded others, if I'm not mistaken, before he was killed by a robot carrying explosives. Now, I covered that whole whole fiasco in high capacity number two, and I tentatively called it the zombie apocalypse episode. That's what I'm calling it now. I think it was titled the zombie apocalypse is here or something like that. Anyhow... That's a possibility, but I don't think that's the case. I think there's two other things that may be at play more than that. I think you may have somebody that realized the whole uh, death threat thing was a lie, possibly, and they decided to see how far they could bait the Waller County administration and trick them into doing something completely retarded. And there's screen caps of this up on the Waller County or Waller countynews.blogspot.com blog. Now, keep in mind, when I send you to this blog, these people really, 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 really do not like the Waller County administration. In fact, their dislike of the Waller County administration may be to the point that it's pathological. Okay? So when you look at that website, look at it with a grain of salt. I considered all of it, and I thought, well, maybe somebody baited them into going with the name that was suggested. And the name that would have been suggested in this case was Micah Johnson. Somebody was thinking on their feet. Now, this Micah Johnson guy, I know he's been making some noise about Waller County. Was it him that made the threat? I can't really say, but, you know, that's definitely a name that came up in our investigation or something like that. And then you get, and then they get goaded and goaded and goaded. And finally, they're giving the name Micah Johnson as a possible suspect. I think that may have happened there's a good chance that that is what happened. Now, it's a small chance, but it's still, in my opinion, more likely than another individual named Micah Johnson making a death threat. I think somebody might have remotely, very possibly, with a remote chance, made a death threat using a social media account with the name Micah Johnson because they either thought it would be funny to get them to accuse Micah Johnson of it, or... They wanted to honor Micah Johnson because they're anti the man. No, it doesn't matter because, and the reason I say it doesn't matter which one of these it is, the Waller County judge made a post and there's a big old screen cap of the post. He posted a reply to a comment that linked to an article on Facebook. The article wasn't on Facebook, but the comment was and the reply was where the articles referring to Micah Johnson and how he was blacklisted by the new Black Panther Party. And the Waller County judge does not say this is the wrong Micah Johnson. In fact, his post leads you to think that it is the right one, which is the whole reason I brought up the whole zombie apocalypse as uh, high capacity number two. But there you go. I mean, you got other possibilities. You got the possibility it was actually somebody named Micah Johnson making a death threat. And it's not the one that was killed by a robot with a bomb. You also have the possibility, like I think, or the possibilities like I think, that it's either they were baited into going with it or somebody made the threats uh, using Micah Johnson's name. But you have other possibilities. You have a possibility that maybe 
somewhere, somehow, somebody, uh, they basically thought, hey, we'll pin it on this guy because I've heard his name in the news. And it, I, if I remember correctly, he didn't like cops. That may be where it came from. There's a number of possible explanations. But you'd think a county judge would at least look at the picture of the article that's being shown on the uh, post that he's replying to and say, it's a different Micah Johnson instead of saying something. I think it was something to the effect of the uh, Black Lives Matter and Texas carry groups are not the problem, but it's their rhetoric, and they may inflame somebody who's not so law-abiding, yada, 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 but actually indicate that the Micah Johnson in the picture above his comment was the right one because that's really what you walk away from. He doesn't deny it in the post. And I haven't really checked on the Waller County News blog <laughs> recently because there's a lot of crazy on that blog. But they do have some good screenshots that are useful and I won't I won't uh I won't go so far as to discount everything simply because they have a uh pathological dislike and that's being very polite. Anyhow, Let's get back to our subject matter and, or not to our subject matter, but away from the feedback segment. As far as uh, show news, I do intend to do more high capacity episodes. I just been real busy this last week at work. It was a miracle I even got two episodes out. I'm very pleased with the results and we'll come back and we'll hit a few things after I, and we're going to talk about 1911s, but first, let me give you the audio on how to find me on social media. And by me, I mean the podcast. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google Plus, And you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Well, I have been very busy doing a number of things. I haven't hit the range anywhere near as much as I would like. But I do want to say before I go any further, because my phone is just blown up with a bunch of Twitter follows, that my my basic philosophy on Twitter following is, as of now, I'm going to look at your, if you follow me on Twitter, before I follow you back, I'm going to look at what you post. If you're posting pornography or spam or anything like that, I'm not going to return the follow. It's as simple as that. Occasionally, I'll go through, I'll clean out follows that no longer follow me. Often, these are so-called gun sense groups or gun sense accounts. But I don't have a problem following people in return for a follow. Anyhow, our topic for this episode is 1911s here, there, and everywhere. You know, there's a number of official variants with the M1911 being the original, it had a flat back strap. The uh, frame behind the trigger was not relieved. The tang on the grip safety was not quite as long as the A1. And there are a few other features that changed between the M1911 and the M1911A1. But the M1911A1 came out, it featured an arched back strap. A relief for, the frame was relieved behind the trigger. The tang on the grip safety was extended. The trigger was shortened. Around 1938 or sometime thereafter, the hammer spur was shortened. Around 1944 or thereafter, the hammer, the sides of the hammer were flattened out a bit more. Now, there were a lot of different materials used in the grips of the 1911. Even today, you can get plastic, you can get, uh, you can get various woods, you can get ivory. In fact, if you want, if you're here in Texas, and you want ivory grips for your 1911, I may know somebody, I haven't checked with them, but I've known this guy for years. I consider him a good friend. I haven't spoke to him in a few years, but he ha he's the owner of Tyler Gunworks. Look up Tyler Gunworks. I believe, I don't know if they got a website or not, but they are on Facebook. And look them up. If anybody in the state of Texas can get you ivory grips for your gun in Texas, because the new ivory laws won't let you ship them across state lines anymore. But if anybody can get them for you in the state of Texas, he will either be able to do it or he will know somebody that can. He also makes some beautiful case-colored 
or case color hardened uh, steel grips for your 1911. And those look real good. In fact, he does some beautiful case color hardening on just about any kind of any kind of steel firearm. If you want something color case hardened, he's the man to talk to. He also does blue wing. He does some uh, other gunsmith work, in my opinion. If you need gunsmith work done, check him out. I mean, he's got a he's got a backlog, from what I understand, because we have a lot of friends in common, and I understand he's got a backlog, but he, he's he's got a lot of skill too. But anyways, like I said, there's various grip materials you can find for the 1911. After 1938, the 1911 got plastic grips. During World War II, it wasn't uncommon to see somebody get a piece of Lex in from a crashed plane and make their own grips out of it and then put their wife, fiance, girlfriend, or even a pinup girl's picture behind the Lex and grips just to give their gun a little bit of a custom look. That wasn't uncommon. Now, there are a couple other official variants. There was the Commander Length 1911, which hit the, uh, which hit the theater with a four and a quarter inch barrel while the regular 1911 featured a 5-inch barrel. And then eventually they came out with an officer's 1911 that had a 3.5-inch barrel. Now you move up into modern firearms and you see a whole host of new features. If I didn't edit that out, I apologize. But anyways, you get into the more modern firearms and you see a whole host of modern features. You'll find a, you'll find some that have a bobtail on the mainspring housing for concealed carry. Most modern 1911s feature the flat back strap, although a few, like my Colt Delta Elite, have the arched. Most modern 1911s will feature a beaver tail grip safety. Many, if not most, will feature a memory pad on the grip safety. Just about all of them will have a commander style hammer. One thing I'm not a big fan of, but you see a lot of, are full length guide rods. I just don't see any benefit to them. And when it comes to sights, anything you can imagine is available. I mean, you have three dot, you have two dot, you have no dot, you have one dot, you even have red dot sights, you have tritium in your dots, you have uh, fiber optics. If you can imagine it for sights, you can find a 1911 configured to run it. Now, you'll also find triggers of various lengths, Uh, the short trigger like the M1911A1, the long trigger like the M1911, you'll find them relieved and lightened in various manners. You'll also find the various hammers are relieved and lightened. As far as modern grips, you'll find things like laser grips, various woods. You'll find various plastic grips. Uh, I like the laser grips on my uh, STI that I put on it, I might add. You'll find grips of various metals, aluminum, steel. You can find various ivory grips like a mammoth ivory, uh, actual elephant ivory, and other ivories that are used You do have to get in the state of Texas if you're in the state of Texas. You cannot order them from out of state anymore thanks to federal regulation. Not a law, just an executive order. You can find grips made of mother or pearl. You can find rubber grips and various other materials and combinations. One of my favorites is spalted wood grips. They have a unique look. Anybody that's really really going to use their gun for as a fighting tool, they may be better off with ivory grips. When an ivory grip is wet, it feels the same as when it's dry. You can find fake ivory. It doesn't have the same, it doesn't always have the same properties, but some do. Now, other features you'll find on some modern 1911s are accessory rails, firing pin safeties. Just about all of them have checkering on them on the front strap and some on the back strap now. And there's a whole host of calibers out there too. Now, some people say if it's not in 45 auto, it's not a 1911, but... You can find 1911s chambered in the 460 Roland, 10 millimeter like my Delta Elite, 400 Corbon, 40 Smith and Wesson. You can also find them in 357 Sig too. I saw one of those the other day. I didn't think you could, but I did see it. You can find them in 38 Super Comp, 38 Super, 9 millimeter. You can even find 1911s in 22 Long Rifle, which brings us to 1911 like firearms. One that's in my safe that doesn't get shot very often is a Kiapa Puma 1911-22. It looks like a 1911, and that's where the similarity ends. It's a fixed barrel, has a horrible trigger, and it, I don't think it has a grip safety. It's been so long since I've had it out of the safe, I don't know. 
Now, another 1911-like firearm is the Colt Mustang. It's like a 1911 that got shrunk down and chambered in 380. Now, that was licensed to Sig Sauer, which started producing their Sig P238 based on it. Then later, they stretched it out and made it a 9mm and marketed it as a 928. Or the P... Blah. The P928. I'm going to say the P's 928, but no, it's a P928. Now, there's a lot more 1911-like firearms. Some people would say I'd have to throw the Ruger 2245 in because it's designed to be a trainer for the 1911, but it doesn't look like one, so no. I know, every once in a while I do come back, I do a 1911 episode, but that's mostly because I get a lot of listeners asking, hey, can you do another 1911 episode, or can you do an episode covering the 1911? I'm like, haven't I done that already? If not on this podcast, on an older on an older show I don't have up anymore and you didn't listen to? No, I'm kidding. You want me to talk about 1911s? I'll do it anytime. Anyways, I'm going to run an audio clip that tells you how to contact me. We'll come back and I'm going to hit one item I heard on the radio in the news. There's not going to be a link to it. It's just going to be one item on the new, in the news. And while the audio is playing, I'm going to see if I can find it and maybe even include a link. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. It's amazing how efficient a modern search engine is. It really is. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like... uh, Oh, here we go. I was about to give up, but it looks like I found it. The headline, and I heard this on the radio earlier today, Federal judge denies UT professors request to block implementation of campus carry. Oh, no. The tears of the liberals must be flooding Louisiana. Oh, that's in poor taste. Sorry about that but it might explain a lot. They don't want to obey the law, so I guess the laws of physics that prohibit time travel keeps their tears from being very effective. However, the part of the the part here that we need to touch on, and I'm just going to read one paragraph, though the lawsuit to overturn the law remains alive, the judge said prof- the professors failed to establish a substantial likelihood of ultimate success on the merits of their asserted claims. Right there. That's it. Now, he wrote an 11-page opinion, and essentially what he, was, what he was doing here was denying an injunction to, hold, to pause the law. And I'll throw a link in now that I found an article. Basically, the story, on, <laughs> the story here is that the Texas law to allow students and faculty to carry firearms for self-defense is alive and well at this point. Now, the federal judge may decide, well, I need to stop this law, so I'm going to go ahead and rule in a way that's not exactly legitimate. And then again, he may not. I hope he doesn't do anything like that. But that's the problem with going to the courts. You never know how the judge or a jury or anything like that's going to react. You have a pretty good idea, but you don't know for sure. That's why so many cases get settled out of court. The cost and the you see the cost of it and you see the likelihood that a ruling can come down that may not be what you want. And as a result, people tend to settle. And that's always a possibility. Don't assume for a second that it's not going to happen because it could. Anyhow, I'm going to say that it's been great getting back behind the microphone. It's been great talking about 1911s. This wasn't the episode I had in mind. I had something else planned, but that fell through. And you may be wondering what that was. I'll give you a hint. I was talking to a young lady that had just got her license to carry. And she she made a point to tell me that she made a point to tell me that her whole purpose of carrying isn't for herself. You may be thinking, oh, she's got kids. No. She's carrying because her elderly mother. Her elderly mother has been attacked more than once. I've been trying to get back in touch with her. She got her license, she's carrying, she's getting real serious about getting training, and she takes care of her elderly mother. You can't go wrong with that. However, let's wrap this up, so stay safe, carry responsibly, and for the love of God, don't generate any bad press, folks. 
be friendly, be courteous, be polite. And at some point, maybe we'll talk about, and this may be a high capacity episode coming up because it's just such a small subject, but maybe sometime I'll get around because I just had an email come in, wanted to talk about recommendations on a firearm for, for open carry. And to the listener that sent me the email, in fact, you may have heard my phone bing just a second ago. That's what that was. For that listener, if you want to hear what Masada Ayub said about that, I do have an episode where I talked to Masada Ayub, interviewed him, and you can hear his thoughts on it. That was back when the podcast was the Open Carry Report. I recommend you go back, check it out, and you know what? That episode is one of my favorites. I can't tell you the episode number because I can't. I don't keep track of that. But that's one of my favorite episodes because when every time I've had a guest on the podcast, I have learned something. And that's an episode that I learned a lot more than than what you hear on the episode. I learned I learned a lot just going back and listening to the interview two or three times. I don't I don't do that. I'll be doing good if I listen to an episode all the way through once and it's my own podcast. I hate the sound of my voice. But I have listened to that episode I've probably listened to that episode twenty times. Just listening to it. I keep picking up on little tiny tidbits. Mr. Masad Ayub is one of those gentlemen that Every time he speaks, there's a chance to learn. And some people don't realize this. In fact, most people don't realize this. But that's the whole reason I do the podcast. I want to learn. Anyways, stay safe, carry responsibly, and for the love of gun rights and the love of God, don't generate any bad press. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.